Brand Studios brought to you by Old Mutual. Welcome to Mix 20. Today we are talking to the highly respected and much applauded producer, playwright, performer, and UCT master graduate, Sipukazi Jonas, uh, all the way from Cape Town. Um, we are both in Cape Town today, so welcome, Sipukazi, and uh, uh, you're going to be taking us through um, a talk on inspiration as well as uh, your most recent and I think extraordinarily popular work uh, on on streaming platforms as much as it was in in the live space. Uh, we are dying here, uh, which tells the story of three women's responses to the prevalence of the violent culture and harassment of abuse, uh, rape, and femicide, which I think sadly is a very topical theme and something that uh, resonated with a with a great number of people from all over the world. Um, to the point that you were even acknowledged uh, in uh, Time Out New York uh, most recently, which is fantastic. So welcome to Music Exchange, the 10th anniversary of, uh, of a conference that has changed, informed um, and enlightened uh, the entertainment economy uh, all the way, well, I think from across the world, um, as we've seen with some of the speakers that we've got in this 10th anniversary edition. And uh, you are one of those esteemed people, so welcome. Hi, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Great. Well, we'll jump right into it. Um, what is your proudest achievement yet and why? Oh, that's actually really easy. I think um, being able to pay rent, um, being able to help out at home, um, being able to pay off a car, um, and the reason that those are, I guess, maybe let me say financial independence is probably the best way to sort of summarize it. Mm. And the reason that I consider that to be my greatest achievement is because I've been able to do that as a full-time artist, as, as a freelancer. And that for me is like really, really important. Something that I think um, affirms the fact that the arts can be a career. They mm -hmm. are a career. It's not just a hobby. So I, when, you know, I think my parents as well, they've just been blown away by, by that, by that realization that it's not just something that you do on the side, you know, there's a struggle attached to it. Um, and unfortunately, there's this narrative around uh, the starving artist, which unfortunately we've seen, right? I, mean, I think, I think it's, it's been earned because of a number of situations, but being able to have that financial independence for me as an artist to be able to say, what do you do for a living? I'm an artist. Mm. That's, that's really my greatest achievement. Mm. Mm. I think uh, you are a gig economy uh, veteran in that regard because you've, uh, you've relied on your art to deliver your art. Um, and, you know, you've, uh, I think, very entrepreneurial in your thinking. Uh, certainly your approach is total ownership, um, which has helped you uh, to this point, and I think it will continue to, to help you. Um, but, you know, talking about that, obviously a lot of lessons have been learned along the way. Um, which is your biggest lesson that's actively informed your success? I think you actually hit the nail on right early, um, earlier on, and that is ownership. Um, making sure that I own my content, but I also own my means of production, right? Because, um, it means then that you can have longevity. I think ownership for me equals longevity. And that means that whether it's a poem, whether you know, it's a, a book, um, whether it's a production, making sure that I own, as an independent producer, making sure that I own the work that I do means that I can reproduce it at any point. It means I can rebrand, rework, um, and, and produce it as a, different, as a different kind of offering. And so ownership is perhaps why, or lack of ownership might be a big part of this trope of the starving artist. Mm. Because mm -hmm. then people, if you know, I mean, we've seen it with big artists like Taylor Swift, for example. True. Where if you don't own, exactly, if you don't own your own work, you don't own your means of production, um, you're really at the mercy of someone else. And mm. so ownership for me is the biggest lesson that I've learned over the years. And it's protected me as a result. 
And I think that's important. You know, uh, I think young artists that are or aspiring artists um, are keen to to get a platform. And uh, historically, when those platforms were were offered, contracts were never read, um, and ownership was uh, was taken. Um, and I think it's important that if you cannot be beholden to the man, then you are in a position of strength very early on. Because I think at the critical stages of your career, when those big opportunities happen you're not having to go through a raft of legalese to get there. So absolutely. And then with regard, <clears throat> then with regard, to, sorry. Oh, sorry. The internet has actually made that more possible. Definitely. Because you don't have to rely on someone else for distribution. I think distribution is sometimes what, um, what, what puts us at a disadvantage. Because if they say, okay, I've got this great song, I've got this great production, I've got, but like, how do I put it out? Um, and the internet is allowing us to, to have greater ownership because we can, we can have our own distribution, we reach our audiences directly. It doesn't have to be mediated by someone else. Um, and you've seen it, I think a very exciting development was with Elaine, who's an independent um, musician and she released only an EP and now has been signed overseas, but she wasn't uh, signed to any of the local, um, any of the local recording companies and is now actually being signed, I think it's to Def Jam. Um, um, but it, it's just, she does, she built an incredible audience and she's been getting radio play and she's been on, you know, she's topping I, I, iTunes charts, everything. And but she's all done it all herself. Mm, mm. And as you said, that's powerful. Um, as powerful as your work, because I think once you, uh, once you lose that, then you lose your voice. And I think that's the, the thing that, it, uh, that you need to hold on to. But with regards to your peers, Obviously, you work with some extraordinary people. You've worked with some extraordinary people. Um, and obviously, there are people in your network uh, that, uh, that have got you to the point that you are so far. Who, who if anyone, um, stands out for you as someone who uh, has really inspired you and uh, given you insight into growing your career to the point that you have? Uh, I think it's been a whole community of people, um, especially when you speak when you speak about peers, because you know you're able to to learn different things and be inspired by different things from different people. One of the people that immediately comes to mind is a friend of mine, Kusumuzi Pagati, who had been in the industry for a really long time, um, and we've had many conversations about arts as a career. So I think we, he's one of the in terms of early on one of the people we're speaking about. It's possible to actually make this a career. Um, but what I've loved about what he's done is he's diversified. Is now he owns he actually owns a bookshop. <laughs> he owns a bookstore now, <laughs> which incredible. is just amazing, right? He's he's a poet, um, and he's a writer, he's a journalist as well. But he actually, and again, it's this issue of longevity. So hmm. he went as far as opening up a bookshop, and it's really doing well. It's creative ideas in terms of how to get people to buy books and so on. Hmm. So I've learned quite a bit from him, especially within the poetry. Um, sector, if I can put it like that, mm. around uh, diversifying within mm. within what you do, being able to 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 look at um, different different ways of of producing work, different ways of packaging. I think he was really good with that as well. I remember he did a production, a show called um, I think Twelve Years of Poet or something. He was able to to create different shows. That one was in Joburg, one was in in Cape Town. Um, so he's he's really great at packaging himself. And so as a peer. Because I think I have a lot of people that I admire who are not my peers, who are just like legends in the industry um, here and abroad. But in terms of peers, he, he, stands, he stands out for me. And uh, to the next point, which I'm sure he's very helpful in, in sourcing, is that where do you go for those insights and that new knowledge about the industry that you service? Um, you know, thinking books and websites and that kind of thing. Um, where do you go to get your learnings? Uh, YouTube is great. <laughs> YouTube is like the hub of everything. There's nothing you can't find because there's, I, mean, I think what I've loved also is tutorials on, mm. on how to edit tutorials. And like we spoke a little earlier, like how to get the lighting right for your video. Mm. Um, and so YouTube is free. It is vast in terms of, of as, as a resource. So YouTube is probably right at the top of the list. Um, I've also been getting a little bit into masterclass which I've really quite, I've been enjoying because they have all of these really um, experienced people in their fields. But what's interesting is also not just focusing on my own field. It's like being able to see what a chef has to say about excellence and what they have to say about their industry. So 
I'm enjoying. Uh, I think in terms of of the internet, but also you know connecting to other other poets who are you know well not just poets actually, but other artists. Um, whether it's through their you know, conversations, through well, I'm not really a big podcast person. I prefer actually getting visuals. But they've been amazing um, Instagram lives, Facebook lives, conversations that have been happening that have been very, very enriching. So I think the internet for me has just exploded. Mm -hmm. And and it sounds to me, and I think that, you know, that kind of leads into into what I I wanted to ask you next is that, you know, it's important, um, you know, it's, it's clearly important to you that you empower yourself, that you understand this business um, and that you, uh, and that you, you learn from it um, rather than necessarily rely on, you know, on a whole network of people that are individually invested. Um, And I think what you've touched on is the fact that as an artist, you can control all those things. Um, You can empower yourself. And if anything, um, you can probably land up producing better work because you are aware of the platforms that you are going to be posting on and obviously um, producing work for. Um, And and that knowledge, um, I'm sure, must, must run through every aspect of when you are considering putting a production together. Oh, 100%. I think the, for me, the one space where, which I would consider this kind of the catalyst of my approach to business as an artist is actually music exchange. Um, the first time which I attended was in 2014. Um, you, would have think, you would have thought that I was lost because there's just this poet in a sea of musicians. Thinking, sure. at, the time, at, at the time you stood out, but it, it, was, it was fundamental. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's my approach as well, is not to be limited to my own sector, not to be limited to my own field, but mm-hmm. to be as collaborative as possible um, and to learn from as many people as possible. So I think that that's, that's where my, my learnings have happened every year. I've been at Music Exchange since 2014. So this is my sixth year. Um, You're and <laughs> So I'm so excited for, for this 10 year anniversary. Um, so so that, that learning has happened through conversation, through, and then especially collaboration that happens afterwards, um, that allows again for ownership and we're not relying on, on the systems that are in place, which is not to say we can't use them, which is not to say we can't tap into them. Um, and, I've, and I've had the, the, the privilege to partner up with some of those, but it's really not to rely on, 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 on those systems. It's a bit like a relationship, I suppose. They, they always say that successful relationships are where you would want something, not need something. And when it goes from a need to a want, it's a very different exchange, right? Very much so. Mm. There's autonomy there, I think. Yeah, and respect. I think that's, you know, if anything, over the last 10 years, Music Exchange has promoted that independent thinking and ownership in order that artists can, uh, can retain and grow and, and build a career for themselves uh, that isn't dependent on you know, on too many factors outside of themselves, like we were saying earlier. But your work, let's, let's talk about that success. What, what, is, what is the vision? Uh, sure. <laughs> I think the vision, which firstly, it keeps, um, it keeps growing with me. I, I, if I look back 10 years ago, I had a very different vision. Mm-hmm. But where I am right now is actually to create the kind of work that works when I'm not working. And so if you think <laughs> income, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it really is important because I actually posted about this yesterday on, on Twitter. Twitter is important. This, I, I have to plug this because my manager would always say Twitter is really important in building community and audience. Absolutely. Um, I posted yesterday and, and it actually did really well in terms of people engaging with that particular post is that I always thought that this idea of, of passive income or residuals was only for um, musicians, for people on television and film, you know, because then at least the, those, the, this repeats, those, um, those pieces of work can, can be used over and over. But as a stage performer, I haven't had that privilege because I have to perform every time in order to make an income. Yeah. And that is, that is exhausting. I think I got tired of having to sweat for every cent is, is how I've been putting it. And so the vision which I've started working on this model with 
we are dying here is to create a whole, um, I guess, network of, of offerings and products around the same concept. So as an example, with we are dying here, we have the stage production, but now we've also uh, just uh, shot a short film. Oh, well. At Cape Town Film Studios, actually. So, which is Amazing. incredible. It's being edited as we speak. Um, we're going to be, we've recorded the song, which everyone had wanted. So the song will actually be available for sale. Uh, we'll be publishing the, the poems as a book. Beautiful. As well. And so, and hopefully we'll even get into television, you know, think of some kind of episodic offering of, of this, of this work. And so what that means is, and merchandise, of course, you can't mm -hmm. forget merchandise. You've got to get those t-shirts and the hoodies. got to have merch. <laughs> <laughs> so that means we don't have to perform every time in order to get an income. Mm, think, yeah, it's around working smarter um, and hard, but working smarter because I, I think you, you, you touched on an interesting point. I mean, your, your most recent production is a classic example of that where um, you did two or three nights in Cape Town. Uh, you took it to Joburg, um, but you were only earning an income on those nights. And also the overhead to make those productions happen was, you know, the, 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 there was a lot of that. Flipping that, and I'm not going to use the word pivot, um, but is that you, you, you took an opportunity out of our current reality and you thought, okay, how can, you know, how can something that is so critically important continue to be told? And the fact that you had captured it on film was so critically important because there were so many people that obviously couldn't make it to the theater, whether it was through means, whether it was geography, but all of a sudden, Supercar Jonas was in the world. And your, and your stage was the world. And it was extraordinary to see that interaction between audiences from all across the world engaging with your work that would never have happened otherwise, right? Absolutely. You know, mm. yesterday I actually got a DM on Instagram from someone in Jamaica who was asking to have, would love to have a conversation sort of sharing space uh, because they'd like to do something similar to We Are Dying Here. And uh, they'd like, Why they'd not? like to know Why not? how we did it. <clears throat> and so, I mean, it's just, the irony, of course, was when we filmed it, and I think this is where, you know, uh, opportunity just meets timing in a, in a beautiful way. The irony was we never filmed it because that was the thinking we had uh, pre-COVID. Pre mm. We never filmed it for streaming. I wanted to be able to just generate content, firstly, to have it recorded, have the production recorded, mm. and then to be able to cut it up into little pieces and use it as content on YouTube, on Instagram, uh, so that when we want to tour the production, we would be able to show what it looks like and kind of pitch using, so using this content. So it was, it was just meant to, to allow us to take the stage performance further. But then with everything that happened, we, we saw the gap. I had a conversation with my manager and we think we have to try something. We have nothing to lose. I think he kept saying to me, we have nothing to lose. And really we did not have anything to lose. Yeah. It turns out we had everything to gain. Yeah. So I think it's worth it's worth taking those 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 risks. Um, and sometimes you don't have everything set up perfectly. I remember when there's a specific um, angle that we wanted, and we couldn't get that shot because of the audience. So we thought, ah, well, we'll reshoot it properly without an audience, so we can get everything that we want. But it turned out that that was the one that that would go around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, besides the subject matter, I think shooting it in situ, in in the moment with an audience, where it's very live and not are, you know, potentially contrived that it, it was even more powerful uh, because you could hear the gaffes, you, you could hear um, something that is being presented in a very one-dimensional or two-dimensional way. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people did speak to the power of, of having an audience. It made them feel when they were watching. We received so many screenshots um, and little videos of people sitting at home on their big screens watching with their families. Mm -hmm. We realized also that changed the audience for us because the, these are people who would not go to theater, yeah. but that they have the access to streaming. So they actually watched with their families and then had conversations in their homes. So it brought us into spaces and opened up um, and developed audiences that we never ever would have had in the theater. Mm -hmm. And that feedback, as you say, across your socials and getting that input uh, or feedback from, from the audience is something that you wouldn't have got in a traditional audience setting uh, because you just can't speak to everyone at the same time. So this, 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 this free flow of information between the very people you're looking to appeal to um, is, is available to you and must certainly feed and inform the work that you plan to do in future. 
Oh, certainly. I mean, this for me has now said, this is ground zero. This has set the standard for how to move forward. Um, I remember in another interview, someone had asked, is this a placeholder or is this the way to go forward? And I thought, if, if, if we consider the move to the digital space a placeholder instead of, um, uh, I guess, progress, we're going to put ourselves at a disadvantage. I, I don't think we should yearn for live performance as some utopia of, 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 of that audience engagement. I think both are now going to coexist. Um, also the live performance is going to be a way into the digital space because that's also the difference between just setting up a camera in your room um, and sharing a poem. But you, know, you still want to have everything that a stage offers, but you know, so many of our audiences are online. Mm. at the moment because you know people are at home and we have no no sense of when things will change but i i don't think that we're going to go back i think this the sense of wanting to go back is 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 counterproductive mm. um, it's really how do you make these two things work for you uh, because now we have a wider audience there are as i said there are people in other countries that will never be able to come and see it live mm. um, unless we go touring yeah. but even even then so we've got to make sure that we're we're, we're making ourselves available. Um, but it also means that you have to, you have to be true to what each, um, each stage or each form requires, each platform requires. So it's not just about taking the stage production and plonking it online. So now we see is actually, what is, what, is, what is the online space demand? And that's why we've gone for the short form because we think we're going to reach a different audience. Um, we'll be able to take it to festivals, we'll be able to take it to conferences, um, hopefully we'll be streamed in classrooms, but also we wanted to, to think about the storytelling itself and say, what, how's it different for film versus what happens on stage? Um, and I think that's what's going to set us apart, is that we're not just trying to, to cheat uh, by, by just putting one on stage yeah. on, on, on film. And you're not shoehorning it either. I think the fact that you can, you can package the content for your socials appropriately, then you will have the desired effect. If you, like you were saying, if you shoehorn it all into, in, in one particular way, you're not going to get a result. People aren't, it's not going to resonate with people in the way that um, it does on Twitter versus Instagram or Facebook for that matter. So understanding those audiences, packaging respectfully to those platforms will get you a result. Um, because, and then also, I think each of those platforms allows you to have a slightly different conversation um, uh, with your audience, which I think your audiences appreciate because not all of your audiences follow you on all of the platforms, right? Certainly. I mean, I've, I've uh, had to be on Instagram, I have to be on Twitter, on Facebook. I haven't quite transitioned into TikTok. Um, I think not I probably. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think maybe Instagram Reels is is making is making is you know making quite an impact right now. Mm. Um, but TikTok TikTok is is a little tenuous, I think, for for the kind of subject matter okay. um, and 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 the conversation that we're having. So um, yeah, so so we're kind of I think it's also finding the. I know this word is overused, but in terms of authenticity, that even the social media has to match your brand. For sure, and I think that that is shown through in all of the work that's, that I've seen you do um, and write, um, that there's a level of consistency, there's a level of uh, authenticity, as you say, yes, overtraded, but no less true. And I think critically, now more than ever, um, people truly understand what that means because they've had a lot of time to live with it um, and they're looking for content that can touch them in a very real way. There's, there's a lot of content out there, uh, but the content that truly triggers and, and uh, a response is, is, is harder to achieve. You know that as a, as a performer on a stage, to, to get an audience to, to be totally engaged with you takes all of you to do that. You know, and for the better part of this year, you've been doing that in a virtual space. That in itself has to be challenge. What I've noticed, um, because there were two things that were a concern at the beginning of lockdown. And the first was, we, you know, as artists, we no longer control the means of production because anyone can jump on Instagram and do a live. Anyone can now film. Uh, so we thought we'd use our audiences because, because you know, we, we, there, was, there was the competition in terms of content creation. 
was much greater. Um, and also one of the things that concerned me really early on is the fact that, you know, we ended up putting work out for free because people now didn't have, you had all these, especially these big artists coming in and giving house concerts and, um, and you know, it was really appreciated. It was nice to see John Legend for free. But, you know, we kind of felt like we were on the back foot because then the question was, how do you get people to pay for the work? If they themselves be like, oh, I can do that. I can just put it on. Um, but I think moving what we did with We Are Dying Here on the COVID Zero site was exactly that in terms of packaging it differently. It, the site itself looks beautiful. Um, I'm sure if you, whoever's watching these, these talks for Mix, um, will see just how beautiful the presentation is stunning. So it feels like you're getting value for what you're paying for. But all, obviously also thinking, you know, having to adjust how we price things because of, you know, the fact that the overheads are lower, people are at home. So thinking about accessibility. So that was the first thing that was a fear is that if, if you have such high competition in terms of content creation, what's going to happen to artists? But then I realized that if your work is authentic, if your work is high quality um, and it connects, then pe people are able to kind of sift through that. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, and this happens on Twitter, is that people are pushing back. Um, you know, celebrity culture has been scrutinized and interrogated and challenged. Um, even influencers, for example, are struggling because people are asking questions. Yeah. People are, are saying, you need to, you don't just tell me, don't just sell things to me. You know, show me, show me the full experience. Uh, you know, and, and they're able to respond. If, if a product, if it's a hair, um, sort of a hair or skincare product and it gives someone a breakout, that, they're getting that feedback immediately. Mm. Um, it's not like with, with television adverts. So now what you find is that audiences are pushing back. Um, and I think that's good. I think that's good. I think mm. that's fair. It's, it's removing that veneer of, <laughs> of kind of celebrity glitz and glam. Mm. And so engagement actually means truth. It means honesty mm. um, because people aren't, aren't, aren't standing for, for that pretense and that facade. And so social media has actually changed quite a bit over the last couple of months. And so my approach has just been to be as honest as possible um, and, be, and be open to, to, to criticism. Mm. Uh, but I also always had this thing of engaging with my audiences. So I even, we, we, test, we test our market. Mm. So sometimes I'll run a poll and say, okay, we, wanna, we want to uh, publish these poems. Which poems do you want? Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not just about you as the artist in a silo creating work for yourself. Um, which of course you want to do, but if you actually want to make a career out of this, if you want to be business minded about this, um, you have to respect your audiences. You have to respect your clients mm. in essence. So we, I actually had a, a message from a friend recently who said, thank you because he's seen how I do that. Like the fact that I reach out to my audience, I say, okay, guys, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? What should we do? And we actually take those suggestions. He did it. And, and then it's free. You'd usually mm. pay for that kind of market research. And he says it actually changed how he launches his music completely mm. because now he knows what, what his, his, his intended audience um, is thinking and feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as we said earlier, nothing about it is forced. Um, <clears throat> and the fact that you, this is not new to you. The fact that we are dying here was done. Yeah. was filmed a year ago, two years ago. Um, I, I, I keep losing time. Um, <laughs> but earlier, yeah, it was actually yeah. Feb. Yeah, so, you know, it, your audience sees that. They, you know, it, it would have been very obvious that if you had kind of cobbled something together and just kind of responded in a particular month or to the fact that the topic was trending, you did that because you, you had this piece of really powerful information to share with people who could benefit from it. Um, and that was what was so lovely about it was that it was, hey, hold on, I've got this thing. Let me, let me let me share it and that feedback that as you say that you uh because you're living in a digital space it's all good and well that you're pushing content at your audience all of the time but if you're not if you're not if you're not responding to what they're pushing at you then you have no community and you've done a great job at fostering and feeding your community respectfully well that's that's my hope that's my hope because it's realizing, I mean, there's people on the other side. I actually see um, social media, that connection as a privilege mm. to be able to, to connect to, to your audience, to be able to hear what people, because it allows what we do to be more of a dialogue and a conversation rather than a soliloquy in some vacuum. Okay. Um, I think it also feeds the work that we do create because, because it's in conversation. It's in conversation. I, I see it as a privilege. I think sometimes 
um, it may come, you know, some people see it as an annoyance, <laughs> but it's a privilege to have the people that you're speaking um, to and speaking about sometimes to actually speak back to you. That's, that's very powerful. I mean, that for me is worth more than money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it, I think it absolutely informs how you respond in future, what you, uh, what you intend doing and talking about the future, um, Live theater, obviously, the, the entire sector is, is still reeling and will reel for a very long time. Um, the idea of live performance for you, is, does it, are you excited by the possibility uh, of, of it coming back? Are you, have you considered how you are going to do this? We've spoken about what you were saying earlier when going into a production, that you're literally building collateral all the time for pretty much during and post the event. But let's fast forward six, 12 months from now um, and, and the potential, the possibility, and also the viability of live performance for an independent artist like yourself. Um, I am excited because there's nothing that compares to live performance. Just that, that relationship between you know, the artist and the audience. You mm. cannot replicate that online, unfortunately. Um, even though we're learning, because I think even something like Zoom versus uh, Facebook Live already makes that difference because you do get, you do get feedback. Um, so I am excited for, for that, but I'm also anticipating change and I'm okay with that. I'm actually excited to see what, what is it, how, how is it different? So for me, the main thing is probably as an independent producer is immediately to think about how to cut down overheads. Um, because you know the cost, the cost involved, and then not being able to get full houses, is is the main thing. But when I I think back some, to something I was actually going to do earlier in the year before everything happened, is I was going to have um, a house concert. Wanted to do a poetry picnic in mm -hmm. our garden. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to probably come back to intimacy. Mm -hmm. What we're going to miss out on is those big shows, those massive shows that require you know thousands of people. Mm. in a space that that that's going to take a while because mm. um, that's really going to be hard to manage mm. but i've seen some interesting things already happening you know mm. um with drive drive through kind of uh theater and cinema um and some interesting uh, you know <laughs> attempts at social distancing so um i actually see it as an opportunity to just change how we've done it the the, the main thing as i said will be cutting down overheads how do we make it viable by making it cheaper but also what is probably going to be helpful is to connect the live performance to the digital experience. Mm -hmm. So that means allowing people to stream in to the live performance, you know, as a lot of comedians have done uh, to, to, to the actual live performance. But there's power in having, as you said earlier, there's power in having an audience in the space. Definitely. Yeah. So that they can catch some of that energy and then actually allowing it to run for a little, little longer. So the best way probably will be not thinking about, um, making uh, your money back through an audience that's in the space, but what happens after you get mm. that live performance? So allowing the the, the streaming to run on uh, for for other audiences as well. I think for you, basically, what it what it's saying is that you can be working twelve months a year, although you're in production hypothetically for three, um, but that your work continues to work for you for the other nine months of the year, which then affords you an income and the ability to be able to work on, on, on more work. So like you were saying earlier, yeah, trialing things at this time is, a, is, a, is, is, a, is, is I think very important for a lot of artists while we have this opportunity, because as much as there's so much adversity, there's, I'd like to hope that there's more opportunity for, you know, for everyone involved to, you know, to kind of up their game, think about how they're doing things because, you know, the revert, if it, if it ever is going to happen, is going to be different and you need to be ready to do that um, if you're going to be counted and relevant in a very competitive uh, environment that you as a, certainly as a playwright, as a performer, um, you know, occupy. I think for me as well, what's important with that is we need to look at how to support artists who don't have the access that we do. So I do, I do know that I'm privileged being able to have access to Wi-Fi, to have access to, um, uh, you know, a camera, lighting, and so on. But I think for an artist who doesn't have that, the live space is going to be important. 
But what I'd love to see, and really this is a gap in which I would have um, loved to see our department step in, is to say now for an artist who is in, a, you know, back in my mom's home village, right, who does not have all of these things, um, how, how do we make that work for them? How do we help them? And I know that even the music exchange and the department here in Western Cape have been doing um, those, those workshops, actually in some spaces where, where young, young, you know, budding musicians are getting some support, but it's to say, okay, now that we've done, we are dying here, how can we then support someone else who doesn't have all of these things to get their work online and make sure that they're getting an income as well? Mm-hmm. Even if it's not, you know, if, if they used to maybe have uh, poetry sessions or these hip hop sessions in the community, you can't now because of, of uh, social distancing, is to say, okay, can we create, uh, whether it's through YouTube or some, you know, platforms like this one to say, let us uh, help mentor those people. Let's actually go there for a week and film. Um, I think we've had this conversation with Martin as well and film and film um, these, these young artists and, 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 and get someone who can professionally uh, edit the video and, and put the work on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a responsibility that we do have because we are making certain assumptions about access when it comes to the digital space. And yet there are so many others outside of it who are not. So that for me, I think once we've figured out what we are dying here, would be to say, especially through my company, say, okay, how do we, how do we uh, extend that, that hmm. privilege? How do we extend that, that access to those? And, and to your point, that is possible. It, it, all that it, I think the only barrier is a will to do that. Yeah. Because if you have a laptop, if you've got a phone, um, and you have an internet connection, plug that into your network, great things will happen. And that's the power of music exchange was <clears throat> and remains that is that let's bring like-minded people together and let's see what comes of it. When you arrived in, you know, in 2014, you were like, <clears throat> you stood up like a, a sore thumb to the, to the, to, you know, to the broader room, but the value both to the room and to you over the years has been realized and continues to be realized, which is really, really exciting because, you know, the pigeonholing that was there in the past is no longer, you know, Sipakazi Jonas can be anything she wants to be, right? Which is <laughs> it, it really is. It really is. Um, and I've tried to push and, and, you know, to kind of encourage other poets as well um, to, 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 to kind of come to conferences like this one mm. and to come and learn because you will definitely pick up a dearth of knowledge. Mm even if it doesn't, and it's really about application thereafter. That's, 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 that's the important thing. So sometimes I see people think, ah, man, if you could just come and just sit down and listen, mm-hmm. um, it would transform everything about, mm-hmm. about how you do it. So I think it's just, you know, getting people um, to, to think, to tap into that. And for me, it was always about not just being gig minded, uh, kind of trying to move from one gig to the next. It's really business. It's like, well, how, how do I make, how, how, how can this be a sustainable business? Because mm. we need, if, if, if I'm hoping to, to retire one day, or maybe not, I don't know, but at least have retirement savings, you know, I've got oh, to well, yeah. do more than gig. Well, let it be your choice, not that you, you know, the day you retire, it, it should only be a choice. It shouldn't, uh, you know, it, there should be no other reason. But Zipakazi, thank you so, so very much uh, for such an enlightening uh, chat today. I think um, <clears throat> a lot like you were saying earlier, um, you know, get involved, you know, be a part of these communities because yes, the, t- the, the topic may not be something that you take away in its totality. And a lot like your, your productions, I come and see a performance. I don't take away necessarily the whole performance with me. There's some parts of it that trigger certain things with me. And that's really what this is about, is that each conversation we have, if there can be at least one takeout from a much bigger conversation, that's a win. That's a reason to be in the room. So thank you so, so much. A privilege and a pleasure, um, as always. And we look forward to the merch, to the book, (laughs) to to the soundtrack. Um, A really, really exciting time. So uh, keep us all posted. And uh, we look forward to hosting you again at Music Exchange. Thank you so much. And I wish for Music Exchange to have, I don't know, like 10 years in multiples of 10, like just many, many, many more decades of, of doing this, this work of supporting young artists. I don't even want, I don't think we can even limit it to musicians anymore. You know, I think um, Megs has just expanded into 
the focus of arts business. And um, so I, I, I really wish, it's almost like I'm wanting to say like, happy anniversary, happy birthday. To you can say that. <laughs> right, happy 10th anniversary Music Exchange. Thank you for existing. Um, thank you for this space. Also, even this, I think being able to move to the digital space in this way is again, an example of, of that adaptability and being able to kind of keep your finger on that, on the pulse in terms of where the world is moving instead of being stubborn about it. Um, so, so it's really exciting and I know that this means that it will reach a lot more people and I'll be punting it as much as I can to make sure that people plug in, get to see and know that they're missing out if they don't. And take a moment to thank yourself uh, and being aware of your contribution because Music Exchange wouldn't be happening in the same way that it is today because of the contribution that you've made over the last six years. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Jason. Cool. Appreciate it. Music has changed. How it makes us feel never will. The time is now to visit mstudios.co.za.